All right, I want to invite you guys to remain standing for the reading of the teaching text tonight. Tonight's teaching text comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. The Apostle Paul says this, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Before I moved to New York, I lived in Orlando, Florida, and woke up one morning, used to get up every morning and walk around my neighborhood, and walking around the neighborhood found that one of my neighbor's homes had partially collapsed into a huge hole that had appeared overnight. They call these sinkholes. A sinkhole uh, exists because there's an underground stream of water that is not known about, but when it dries up, it creates a gap, and the weight of what has been built on top of it is too much for what is underneath it, and it falls into the hole. Here's another sinkhole. You don't want to be driving down the road and hit that thing, like that bus did. I, I use this because in many ways, Many people in our world today are dealing with sinkhole syndrome. The weight of their life is too great for the inner resources that they have. And so when time comes, pressure come, anxiety come, cultural stress come, they find themselves collapsing into a hole where there should be strength and life in their inner being. If I could put it in one sentence, it's this. People's lives collapse when their inner world does not have the power to handle the pressure of their outer world. Now, this is hard because we don't live in a culture, particularly uh, here in New York, where people prioritize your inner life. People will ask you, what'd you do this weekend? Where'd you go? What'd you get up to? But nobody's like, hey, could you just tell me about how your inner life is doing? How's your soul doesn't feel like an appropriate conversation when you're running your workplace plans? And so as a result, and because we live in such a media-saturated world, we fall into the trap and the danger of focusing on the outer world to the neglect of our inner world. If you focus on the outer world only and you neglect your inner life, five things will happen to you that are precursors of sinkhole syndrome. The first one is that you will live a reactive life. And what I mean by that is that you will not have a proactive spirit that you live from and live out of. All you will be is a conduit of reacting to whatever events happen to be getting the attention in our world today. Unfortunately, particularly for this younger generation, this has been true of you. You've grown up in a culture that has stolen your attention and turned it into a commodity and weaponized it against you, robbing you of the capacity to live inwardly and focus on your heart. And so as a result, all you are is the perpetual posting and reacting to whatever our culture says you should care about in your life. No greater example of that, I think, than this week. What most people think about sexuality, most, what, what most people think about wars, what most people think about politics. We just hear from whoever happens to have cultural power. Our lives regurgitate as receptacles of whatever information is told to us, and then we pass it on to everybody else in our field, in our spheres, uh, in our streams, and in our life. So unintentionally, because of the time of history we live in, we live reactive lives. 
If all you do is react, you will never have an inner sense of rootedness, and you'll be perpetually insecure. You won't know who to believe or what to trust. You won't know if you've done enough, if you're good enough. And so you'll always be slightly hesitant, wondering if you've got what it takes to respond to the events that are being thrust on you. And then, if we're not careful, this can produce a sense that we're unwanted. How many people, though we don't use the term FOMO anymore, still feel this acutely? Something probably happened this weekend that you saw on social media that you didn't know about, and now you're here in church looking for the Holy Spirit to comfort you because you feel left out because your friends did something. This can be a part of our reality. What is a dating app? A dating app, as one of my friends said, is like Amazon Prime to deliver you hot people. All of a sudden, all you are is a visual commodity for somebody else's sexual desire. And you can never tell, do they want me for me or just to alleviate loneliness or make them feel good in a sad season? If this continues, we get to the point where we're hopeless. We feel like our world is going to be worse than it ever it is. We feel like this is the worst time in history. We feel like everything's a threat. The planet's going to melt down. Everybody's going to go to war. Everything is falling apart. The economy's going to drop off a cliff. We shouldn't have kids. There's no future. The world is over. We live with a hopeless narrative. And ultimately, this leads to a point of exhaustion where a lot of people live their lives slowly grinding and managing out their obligations without a deep sense of joy or life. And the truth is, the, the social sciences point to the fact that this generation is the most reactive, insecure, unwanted, hopeless, and exhausted generation in all of recorded history. Please listen to me. This is a disproportionately young service, okay? I want to say this to you. Do not let that be your story. You are not destined by God to live a reactive, insecure, unwanted, hopeless, and exhausted life. God has got more for you. Well, how do you access that more? Well, we're going to talk tonight about the idea of everybody's favorite word, vivification, okay? The idea of vivification. This is one of those theological terms that we don't talk about very often. In fact, how many of you have ever in your life heard a sermon on vivification? Okay, absolutely nobody in this room. So boy, do I have some good news for you tonight. <laughs> vivification is the process by which the Holy Spirit imparts new spiritual life to those who believe. Listen to these words animating them with the life of Christ and empowering them to live in obedience, faith, and love. It's the positive act aspect of sanctification. Three weeks ago, I spoke on sanctification. Last week, I talked about mortification. This is the positive side of it where we are energized and renewed to live a life of righteousness and holiness. I want to say to you, it is absolutely possible, in spite of what is happening in our culture and happening in this generation, to build an inner world that can handle the pressure of anything happening in your outer world. How did Jesus do it? How did Jesus walk on this earth and forgive his enemies and his friends who betrayed him and the crowds who one day are yelling Hosanna and the next day crucify him? How did Jesus do it? Well, here's the answer. Jesus had an inner world that gave him access to a relationship with another world that gave him power to overcome this world. And so I want to talk tonight about how to build that inner world. And it's possible, Paul says to the Corinthians, therefore we do not lose heart, though our outer man is decaying. I feel this. Yet our, in Why are you laughing? Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. That's what I feel the most. Dallas Willard says this, our soul is like a stream of water which gives strength, direction, and harmony to every area of our life. When the stream is as it should be, we're constantly refreshed and exuberant in all we do because our soul itself is then profusely rooted in the vastness of God and His kingdom. And all else within us is enlivened and directed by that stream. Therefore, we are in harmony with God, reality, and the rest of human nature and nature at large. So we're going to look at vivification through this passage tonight in Ephesians chapter 3. Now, the original context of this passage, you'll realize it comes from Ephesians chapter 3. This is from the book of Ephesians written to the church in Ephesus. And you'll remember that the church in Ephesus uh, was sitting under the cultural weight 
of the goddess Artemis in the city. Artemis absolutely dominated the economic system, the social system. She dominated the cultural calendar. Everything in that city was about Artemis. And so you have these Christians, A, they're in Rome, B, they're in this, this city where they're absolutely controlled by a narrative that does not reinforce their faith. And they've got to be walking around. Think about this, just a couple of decades after the resurrection of Jesus, they are a percentage point of a percentage point in terms of culture, uh, cultural presence in the Roman Empire. And they've got to be thinking, in what way does my personal belief in Jesus have the capacity to resist the power of my city and then deal with the reality of life in the Roman Empire? And so Paul wanted them to know it can and it will be so buoyant within you that eventually the temple of Artemis will be a point that Christians come and visit and Rome will be brought to its knees within three centuries without Christians lifting a weapon because the potent love that God put in them was so powerful, it overcame the empire around them. So this is the prayer he's praying for them. Even though they're a tiny percentage of the society, he wants them to see there is a power available for you if you learn to be present and walk with God that will give you an inner life that can handle any outer challenge. Now, this is going to require that we move from a reactive to a proactive understanding of how we live our faith out. Now, I'm about to give you a little model here. This, is, this model is the rest of my sermon. And it's taken from a combination of Viktor Frankl, who was a, a psychologist who survived Auschwitz and came up with a school of philosophy called Logotherapy. And he basically wanted to answer the question, when he was in Auschwitz, and he, he tried to figure out who despaired of life and gave up in the Nazi death camps, and who made it through and went on to build a resilient life that would flourish. And he tried to answer the question, what was the difference between these two people? And he realized there was this one potent truth, and here was the truth, between stimulus and response, there is a world of agency and freedom. Stephen Covey talks about this in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. A lot of times, something happens to us. Our culture puts pressure on us, anxiety on us. Maybe your roommates do, your boss does. You've got all of these things coming at you, and most of us just distribute and pass along like a rugby pass straight to the next person. Everything that is coming at us. But he says, no, there is a world of freedom that you can live into and draw from that enables you to be a kingdom presence in the world. Now, in our world today, the majority of people, if you were to look at their inner life, when they respond, they're reacting out of things like this, their own personal hopes, maybe fears they've got, the sense of alienation, bitterness, envy, ambition, pride, their dreams, loneliness, the longings that are in their heart. And so what ends up happening is pressure comes to people in our culture. They draw from their own inner resources and then they do their best to make it through life. And I just want to say, you may think right now, John, this talk's not for me, I'm killing it. You're killing it for now. History has a very strong track record that you will run out of energy. That's the problem with modern mindfulness techniques. You are living in a culture that's destroying you. You are not only a victim of that culture, but a perpetrator of the very same culture. And now the solution is to go inside yourself to find the answers for the very thing that you've helped create to help you deal with the thing that you're struggling with. That's better than nothing. But there's something better than that. Yeah. And so let's look at what Paul says is possible in the human heart so that we can not just respond, but we can live out of what God's got for us. Point one, point number one, you have to move from outer exhaustion to inner power. Outer exhaustion to inner power. Look at what Paul says, Ephesians 3.16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, this is a wild verse. He says that your inner being, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, will not have your own capacity and riches, but you will have access at the deepest part of who you are to the glorious riches that God has made available. Now, I want you, I want, I want you to see this. God has put within you 
a power that you can draw on in any circumstance, your most complex business deal, your most stressed out intern moment, your most, the worst day you've ever been on in your life. Inwardly, you have access, not just to your own power, but to the glorious riches. Here's a couple of examples of how the Holy Spirit makes what's available from God's glorious riches available to us. Number one, we have an inner counselor. He provides wisdom and guidance for us as believers. We need counsel. What do I do? I feel stuck. I need wisdom. He speaks to us in the deepest part of our heart. You have a guide who leads individuals in understanding and following God's will. You've got a decision you need to make. You're not sure of it. Lord, guide me. You have a comforter. He offers solace and peace in times of distress or hardship. You have a teacher. He enlightens believers by revealing spiritual truth and deepening our understanding of Scripture. You have accountability. He convicts of sin, prompting repentance and transformation. You have a helper. He assists in our weakness, providing support in our spiritual endeavors. You have a sanctifier. He purifies and makes believers holy, fostering spiritual growth. You have an intercessor. He prays on behalf of believers, bridging our lack of prayer with God's ability to pray. You have an empowerer. He gives spiritual strength and gifts to live out God's purposes. You have an illuminator. He shed light on God's word, helping believers to grasp its meaning. You have an inner visionary, enabling us to dream about the future that God has for us. Listen, we're sitting here bored with our faith when the unlimited resources of heaven are here to help you in your actual life. And all God says is, in your arrogance, would you take 10 minutes and inquire of me? I know the plans I've got for you. I know why I put you at this point of history. I know the good works I've got for you. Don't wing it in your own gifts when infinite wisdom and help is available for you. Romans 8 says this, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, four words, repeat them after me. What does it say? Is living in you. Is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Friends, listen to me. The world wants you to be shallow and distracted with trivial things that mean nothing in a week. And God wants you to be deep, and profound, and full of wisdom, and spiritual insight, and power, so you can live for eternity this week. It's a choice about where you're drawing the source and activity from. This is what Richard Lovelace says, we should make a deliberate effort at the outset of every day to recognize the person of the Holy Spirit to move into the light concerning His presence in our consciousness and to open up our minds and to share all our thoughts and plans as we gaze by faith into the face of God. We should continue to walk throughout the day in a relationship of communication and communion with the Spirit, mediated through our knowledge of the Word, relying upon every office of the Holy Spirit's role as counselor mentioned in Scripture. We should acknowledge Him as the illuminator of truth and of the glory of Christ. We should look at Him as teacher, guide, sanctifier, giver of assurance concerning our sonship and standing before God, helping in prayer, and as the one who directs and empowers our witness. Listen, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit would speak to them and tell them what to do next. God still does that today. So few people listen. In the Bible, God would give leaders in the most complex secular environments insight in how to shape nations and kingdoms. But today, nobody seems to listen. We've distracted ourselves into spiritual oblivion when infinite wisdom and help is made available. Listen, you're not destined to live like that I know that you will be the kinds of people who take what Jesus has made available through the Spirit into your life. So I've got good news. You do not have to react out of the anxiety of the world. First thing you have, next slide, is you have power that shapes the way you choose. Second shift that needs to happen, from outer rejection to winner love. Now this next verse here, it's really hard to believe this is in the Bible that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. What a phrase. It's like, I want you to know what you can't know. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This is the great differentiator between the Christian faith and every other philosophical tradition and religious option. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. 
when Christ is in us, listen, listen, you know when you read the Gospels and you see how Jesus was merciful to those caught in sin? Do you remember the woman caught in adultery and the Pharisees come to throw stones and he says, who was without sin throw the first stone? And he drives a wedge between the accused and the guilty to create space for a new life. And he says, who is it who condemns you? I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know, you, you know that Jesus from the Bible, the one that goes where everybody else avoids to go, that it was a friend of sinners, that had mercy, that made disciples, who was patient, who was gracious. If that Jesus is in you, what do you think your inner walk with God should be like? You should be experiencing on the interior part of your life, the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels that's just happening in your heart. And it's been my experience that most Christians have an inner voice of shame and accusation, not an inner voice of mercy and love. Most people, the inner voice of their life is, it's their parents' voice. You're not doing enough. I wish you were more. I wish you were better. What a disappointment you've been. The inner voice is the voice of an ex-lover. I don't want you. There's someone better. Or it's a self-condemning voice. I can't live up. I can't achieve. I can't do enough. But what would it look like to have the voice of Jesus in your heart and his love being the loudest voice inside of you? God wants you to have the experience of that love. The Holy Spirit's job, according to Romans 5, is to take the Jesus of the Gospels and take the things you love on the pages of Scripture and make them your inner experience in your relationship with Jesus. Which means when you struggle with sin, Jesus moves towards you to forgive you, not against you to condemn you. Which means when you don't understand discipleship, He'll give you insight, He'll rebuke you, love you, but He will take you into the fullness of what God has for you. You get to experience through the Spirit the love and mercy of Jesus in your heart personally, not just historically on the pages of Scripture. The experience of love. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. One of the commentators had this little riff about this and he says this, We can see love's breadth reflected in God's acceptance of Gentile and Jew equally in Christ. Look who's included, anyone who would trust Jesus. Doesn't matter your cultural category. You can be included in Him. We can see love's length in God choosing us before the foundation of the world for a salvation that will last for all of eternity. We can see love's height in having Christ blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ and in His raising us up and seating us with Him in the heavenly places. And we can see love's depth in God reaching down to the lowest levels of depravity to redeem those who are dead in trespasses and sins. God's love can reach any person in any sin and it stretches from eternity past to eternity future. It takes us from the very presence of God and sits us on His throne. Folks, that's pretty good on a screen. You should understand what that feels like in your heart. This is not just about ideas or theology. This is about mystic, sweet communion in the soul. Someone once asked the famed jazz trumpeter Louis Armstrong to explain jazz and he replied, man, if I got to explain it, you ain't got it. And it's, it's almost like this about the love of God. This is not just cognitive knowledge, theological understanding. This is an animating desire. Let me illustrate. The reason I decided to marry my wife, Christy, been married 26 years. I, I had dated other girls. I, I think it's safe to say in some measure I had loved-ish other women. But there was always an element, honestly, of like, what are they doing for me? You know, like there was always an element of like, are you meeting my needs? And, you know, are we intellectual equals? How much energy do we have? There's all this sort of stuff. But when I met my wife, I was completely lost in an other-centered gaze. There was not like, well, are you going to meet my needs? I was so caught up in this woman that it was that my joy was to be with her. I wasn't like, what can you do for me? All I wanted was like, I just want to be with you. Like, what do you want to do? It doesn't matter. I'll go to Denny's, the worst food on earth. As long as I can just be at the table with you, I will eat moons over my hammy or whatever it is. Anywhere we went was transformed into heaven because she was there. And you know this, when you're in love, lovers create a secret world that nobody else has access to. Isn't that true? You walk into a room, you can look at their face and you're like, oh, she's feeling it. 
She's feeling it. You can walk into, and you've got dates that matter to you. You've got little idiosyncrasies that you understand about one another. There's a different kind of attention, communication, humor, meaning, a shared sense of future, a presence. You sort of lose yourself in the other. And look, here's what I want you to understand. It is possible for you to have a relationship with Christ like that in your heart. In the same way that a human relationship can do that, it is possible in the middle of New York City to have to create a secret world with Christ where in spite of what your employer is saying, you are living heaven on earth because Christ is within you. This is an experience that is offered to you in Jesus. Some of my most profound spiritual encounters have not come preaching or even praying. They've come in the workplace. This is Brother Lawrence practicing the presence of God, and it is possible to know this love experientially. Listen, I want to say this to you. Never settle for shallow theology when you can have the infinite reality of life with Christ in your heart. Head knowledge is not enough. Head knowledge will not give you power to resist the temptations of the world, but a deeper love, a truer love will give you power to resist. Now listen, I, I say this carefully. You know, when I was in college, being from Australia was helpful. <laughs> but I just want to say this. There was, there was no other women in the world for me. My world was in her world. And when you are caught up in love with Christ, this is the key. Not gritting your teeth or white-knuckling self-control, but surrendering in love to Christ. The promise here is that we can experience the fullness of God. You're all full of something. If you... <laughs> have you gotten on the subway? I don't even have a reference point for why you're laughing because of my holiness. <laughs> Have you gotten on the subway before and bumped into someone and they like come at you? And it's like, oh, I just tapped you, but you're full of anger. And to tap you, it leaks out. Some people are full of fear. Some people are full of lust. Some people are full of pride. And here's what God promises. Regardless of what happens in our culture, you can be full of love. Is this not Jesus on the cross? Under the most, the pressure is so great that thinking about it makes him sweat blood. And yet on the cross, what comes out of Jesus? He's been crucified and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Enemy love comes out under pressure. He sees his mother and he says, son, behold your mother. He's thinking about his mom on the cross. And then he's getting wrung out, about to experience the Father's wrath for our sins. And yet what does he say? Father, into your hands I, I commit my spirit. Here is the best man who's ever lived under the most acute pressure on earth. And what leaks out of him is enemy love, concern for others, and trust in his Father. And so I just want to say that it's possible, this is the prayer, the invitation, that we would be so filled with the love of Christ that when we get under pressure, we do not distribute the spirit of the age, but we distribute the love of Christ that comes from us. So number two, you were filled with power, but you're also filled with love. Number three, from outer fragility to inner stability. That Christ, Ephesians 3.17, may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, listen, a lot of us hope that God would visit us one day, but I just don't think that any of us really believe that the invitation is for Christ to dwell in us. It says, maybe we're like, listen, I'm going to try and be good enough and maybe God will show up and give me a special magical devotional time. Like if I don't look at porn this week, if I'm really good, if I forgive my enemy and don't envy my boss, maybe I'll have a magical morning time where the Bible will come alive. Maybe um, you can feel like you're so insignificant. Like why would God care about you? It's a pretty big world. He's got a lot going on. So why would he care about you? The thing is when you read the Gospels, Jesus seems very interested in normal people that nobody else cares about. The theme of the Bible from Eden to heaven is God's desire simply to be with his people. He wants to dwell with us. How does the book of Revelation end? Behold, the dwelling of God is with humanity. That's how it ends. The word here, katoikio, dwell, is a compound word formed from kata, which means down, and oikio, which means to inhabit a house. 
in the context of this passage, the connotation is not simply that of being inside the house of our hearts, but of being at home there, settled down as a family member. When people come visit me, they, they get, I, I, don't, I don't perceive myself to be intimidating, but I can understand why people maybe for a moment feel that, okay? And so sometimes when people meet with me, that they can be very, very formal, okay? Pastor John, it's uh, great to meet you. you know, they're very, very formal, okay? <laughs> My family member's are like, yo, Dad, I'm hungry. Why don't you cook me a steak? <laughs> I'm like, okay, doing steak. So casual, so comfortable, fully at home, fully know who they are. Jesus doesn't want to be a guest who pops in when you clean the house up neat enough. He wants to dwell in you and be with you and do life with you. Look at John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. What? Most of us think that God's out there somewhere, up there preoccupied with the big stuff of the universe. The Bible's making the claim that he is in there. You are the temple and he wants to do life with you. The beauty of this, if Christ Christ dwells with us, is that means we have permanent access to his presence within us. Therefore, we can be rooted and we can be grounded. That's what this verse says, being rooted and grounded in love. Now, this is fascinating. Roots under stress go out and look for nourishment to hold the tree up. And a building is only as good as its foundation. And you are seeing this right now. People in our culture are desperately sucking up from the cultural soil or the stories of their own lives, some sort of peace, some sort of mindfulness, some sort of stability, and the best of them are being pushed over. And people are trying to build their lives, and they're completely falling over. But the Bible promises, because Christ is here, that under stress, we go deeper into God's love, and we're more planted And that we have a foundation in our heart where no matter what happens on the surface of our lives, the foundation is good. We can always rebuild in a new season because God is with us. This is extraordinary. Listen, people without proper roots and a proper foundation will have a scarcity mentality that turns people into a commodity so they can survive. But people with a source beyond themselves and a foundation built by another have a life that can freely give themselves away because they know they will not be diminished as they give themselves. Look what happened in Jesus, John 13. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. How's that? You've got your mate over for dinner and Satan's in him and he's about to betray you. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. What, What security? All things are under his power. He's come from God and he's gone back to God. So he gets up from the meal takes off his outer clothing and wraps a towel around his waist. It is the most secure people who are free to serve others because they know they're not going to lose anything by giving themselves away because they have an inner river of life that is a gift from God. These kind of people have a stability that enables them to survive anything that is thrown at them. So you don't have to react to the culture. You don't have to get caught in the trap of living a shallow, outward-focused life. You get Next slide, internal power. You get internal love, you get internal stability. Last one, from cultural rumination to kingdom imagination. This is massive. Rumination involves the repetitive and passive thoughts focused on the causes and effects of a person's distress. However, these thoughts don't lead to the person engaging in active coping mechanisms or problem-solving strategies that would leave distress and improve the mood. So it's cultural rumination. This is what our culture does. Our culture is obsessed with what is wrong with it. It perpetually ruminates on brokenness and broken problems in our culture, politics, war, economic exclusions, and grievance, in such a way that it has convinced itself that this is the worst time in all of human history to be able to live. There is no way forward, save political action, and for the most part, we're all being screwed over. And so what, de- what develops as a result of this is this sense of fatalism and despair and passivity. What's worse is that economic interests are now being mapped on to the media that exist to sell you despair for a living. So we're perpetually ruminating in our culture on everything wrong with our world. And here's why that's unhealthy, because it produces a concept called resentment. It's like resentment, but worse. 
Resentment is a philosophical concept introduced by Nietzsche to describe a deep-seated resentment, envy, and hostility that arises in groups or individuals who perceive themselves as powerless or oppressed. It involves redirecting one's frustrations and feelings of inferiority towards others, often leading to the creation of moral values that favor weakness over strength. In essence, he's saying this produces a culture, cultural victim mentality and anger towards anybody who you perceive to have unjustly earned power that you think you deserve. Now listen, I'm not saying there's not elements of this. I'm not saying the world's amazing. I am not your toxic positivity guy, okay? And I know that the world has elements of it where people are legitimately hurt. But I'm just saying, you are not destined to be controlled only by cultural forces. This is not the only story. You are given the capacity to have a kingdom imagination. Look at what Ephesians 3 says. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You see, if my hope was in politics, I'd be living a not great life. And if my hope was only in this age and modern technology, I'd probably want to tap out. There's, there's not a lot here. And a lot of times people will come to me and they'd say, look, dude, why don't you move somewhere easy to pastor? Go, go somewhere where it's not as intense and people stay longer. And uh, New York, like, isn't it struggling spiritually? And I'm like, according to which dynamic? When I look at New York, I don't look at it through the lens of sociology or statistics. I look at it through the heart of God and redemptive history. And everything says to me that this may be the most beautiful, perfect place for God to break in with extraordinary power and for something to happen. I've got a kingdom imagination. I'm not just culturally ruminating on brokenness, and I haven't got a grievance victim-based identity. I'm believing that God can do more than I can ask or imagine. But it's hard sometimes. It's hard sometimes. It's hard when you look around and like Christian leaders are failing. You're just literally waiting for who's going to be next. It's hard when you look at your life and you're, you're claiming the promises and nothing's changing. And the great temptation then is to make our circumstances our reality and not God's power our possibility. That's a real challenge. Look, we, we see this in Mark's gospel with the father who has a demon-possessed kid and the disciples can't get rid of it. Look at this. How long has he been like this? You remember this story? The disciples try and drive this demon out of this kid and the demon won't come out. And so the disciples always do what disciples do when they lack power. They go back to a theological debate, okay? <laughs> How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answers. And look, listen to this father's genuine disappointment with the disciples despair and frustration at the pain he's been carrying so long? From childhood, he answers, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But then he says this to Jesus, but if you can do anything, take pity on us. His greatest hope in light of everybody else's failure is that Jesus might give him a little bit of comfort or a little bit of help. And then Jesus says, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. And then the father says, help me overcome my unbelief. And so Jesus cast the demons out. Listen, I want you to see this. A kingdom imagination is not built on your current circumstances. It's built on the person of Jesus in front of you. And Jesus says, you need a shift from can you do anything to hearing Jesus say, I can do everything. And when we go from anything to everything, we move from sight to faith and we enter into the place where God can actually break in and transform our circumstances. Don't look at what's happening around you. Don't look at the failure of the church. Don't look at the failure of your friends. Don't look at the powerlessness of this moment of history. Get your eyes in your inner being on the person of Jesus and realize he can't just do anything. He can do everything. So here's the fourth thing you've got. You've got power on the inside of you. You've got love on the inside of you. You've got stability on the inside of you. And you've got a kingdom imagination on the inside of you. I'm very, very optimistic about your future. So, 
How do we care for our inner world? Just a couple of practical thoughts and we'll respond. The first one, you've got to care for your inner world. You've got to care for your inner world. You cannot outsource the building and care of your inner world. Our church can't do it for you. Your mentor can't do it for you. Even God can't do it for you. You've got to do this. You've got to care for your inner world. New York City is not committed to the prosperity of your inner world. It's committed to your capacity to produce for whoever you happen to work for. You've got to care for your inner world. So you've got to keep the stream. John Ortberg wrote a beautiful book uh, called Soul Keeping, and he opens the book with a parable. And I'm going to read this parable to you, okay? Because I think in a second you'll understand the dynamic of it. He says, there was once a town high up in the Alps that straddled the banks of a beautiful stream. The stream was fed by springs that were as old as the earth and deep as the sea. The water was clear like crystal. Children laughed and played beside it. Swans and geese swam on it. You could see the rocks and the sand and the rainbow trout that swarmed at the bottom of the stream. High in the hills, far beyond anyone's sight, lived an old man who served as the keeper of the springs. He'd been hired so long ago that now no one could remember a time when he wasn't there. He would travel from one spring to another in the hills, removing branches or fallen leaves or debris that might pollute the water. But his work was unseen. One year, the town council decided they had better things to do with their money. No one supervised the old man anyway. They had roads to repair, taxes to collect, services to offer, and giving money to an unseen stream cleaner had become a luxury they could no longer afford. So the old man left his post high in the mountains. The springs went untended. Twigs and branches and worse muddied the liquid flow. Mud and silt compacted the creek bed. Farm waste turned parts of the stream into stagnant bogs. For a time, no one in the village noticed. But after a while, the water was not the same. It began to look brackish. The swans flew away to live elsewhere. The water no longer had a crisp scent that drew children to play. Some people in the town began to grow ill drinking it. All noticed the loss of sparkling beauty that used to flow between the banks of the stream that fed the town. The life of the village depended on the stream, and the life of the stream depended on the keeper. The city council reconvened. The money was found. The old man was rehired. After yet another time, the springs were clean. The stream was pure. Children played again on its banks. Illness was replaced by health. The swans came home, and the village came back to life. The life of the village depended on the health of the stream. The stream is your soul. You are the keeper. It is so important that you take care of what you let into your inner world. No one else can do this for you. Your community group, your accountability group can't. You've got to get a vision of building an inner world where Christ loves to dwell. That, that's, why, that's why just mindless doom scrolling is not sinful. It's just stupid. It, listen, it's robbing you of communion with the God who can help you. It's robbing you of the voice of love and not comparison that can reassure you. It's, it's robbing you of the wisdom to succeed in your job if you just listen to God's advice on what to do vocationally. And so, so often we just let anything into our hearts and then we wonder why we've got so much condemnation, so much exhaustion, so much fear, so much guilt, so much shame. Those of you who know me know I'm a psycho of what I let in. The amount of movies I've walked out of because I'm like, I just don't need this crap in my soul. But you paid $8. I got an eternal soul. I got an eternal soul here. The movie can wait. Here's my point. Here's my point. I say this genuinely in humility. Many people say to me, dude, you've had a wild life. I've been through some gnarly stuff. And they say, how can you have been here this long and still have a heart with so much passion, so much vision, so much joy, so much hunger? Do you want to know the answer? I'm keeping the stream. I'm keeping out the stuff that can poison my heart, rob my vision, corrupt my desires. No one else will do this for you. There's a life of staggering possibility. Do not treat it as a trivial thing. Number two, you have to learn to renew your heart. Not just keep your heart, learn to, you need to learn to renew it. Rebecca Lyons uh, has this concept. She just calls them rhythms of renewal. I think this is really important. Every single one of us under stress looks for relief. Where do you go for relief when you're stressed? You will either go 
to the secret place. This is where Jesus went. went, Or you will go to the third world. Third world is what the place sociologists call that we create to deal with the pain of our lives. The third world can be a park in Brooklyn to go hook up with someone. The third world can be Netflix. The third world can be anything. But it's under stress. Where do you go for comfort? Where do you go to get power? Do you have escapist thoughts? Where are they taking you? Everybody will experience stress and exhaustion. What you do with that exhaustion will set you up to go to the next level in your life or it will trap you in shame where you medicate your current reality. And I just want, I want to plead with you, make it your goal to go to the secret place and not build a third world of escape. Now look, sometimes people come to me and they say, your devotions are long. And they think I'm super pious, like, man, here you are, just, you know, just caught up in the heavenlies. And I'm like, no, 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 here's what's doing. I'm mad at people and I've got bitterness. And I don't want this to pollute my heart. And so I'm taking this back to the cross in my inner life and saying, Jesus, I need you to do what you did on the cross. I need the heart that does that on the cross for these people. I need you to change my heart. When I'm losing vision and I'm just collapsing inward because it all feels too much, I need Jesus to go, lift your eyes, man. I am not done with you yet. There are still good works prepared in advance for you to walk in. It doesn't matter if other people don't finish their race. You run yours. I'm getting vision in a secret place. I'm not there doing little devotion. I'm not doing a quiet time. The last thing I'm doing is a quiet time. I'm warring for a fully alive spirit in secret so that I can lead this church from the secret place and try and build a a future in God that is worthy of the calling that He's given us. You, You Listen, under stress, you will medicate and escape or you will retreat and you will be renewed. Either way, you're going to leave and you're going to come back. Only you determine how you show up when you do. You've got to commit in your heart. You've got to build that secret place. Luke 4, the Spirit, leads Jesus into the wilderness. It says He comes out with power. He goes back to a night of prayer. And then we read in Luke 5, power was coming out from Him and healing them all. What you do in the third world will come out and affect everybody around you. And what you do in the secret place will come out and flow out of you and affect everybody around you. I'm pleading with you to build rhythms of renewal from the secret place and not the third world. And then lastly, this I think is really important. You've got to learn to strengthen yourself in the Lord when all hell breaks out against you. Listen, if if your faith in God does not work when you're in hell, you need another faith. This thing is designed to get you through life. Right now, our brothers and sisters in Iran are in prison. Every morning, women wake up at the thought of being gang raped in prison that night to lead a Bible study. There's people who've been in prison for 20 years in China for their faith and for leading church movements. And they're thriving in their spirits because they built such a robust life that the pressure around them cannot rob them of vision. And I want to say this, things will come at you. Your heart will be broken. You will be betrayed. Things will not go how you want. You will be disappointed and disillusioned. And it's in those moments you've got to learn to strengthen your heart in the Lord. This is what happened to David in 1 Samuel 30. When David is away, the Amalekites, his long-term enemies, come back. They capture Ziklag and they take away his family and the families of all of his men. And they are so brokenhearted, so in such a state of despair. It says they wept till they could weep no more. And they're getting ready to stone David because they're so angry at him. And David does not collapse into their anxiety. It says this, David steps aside and he strengthened himself in the Lord. And then you know what he does? He asks God, what do I do next? And God tells him, go after him. You're going to get them all back. He looks for wisdom in the secret place from the Lord and he does not just start scrambling in a free fall to deal with the panic of the people who are around him. And I believe that God wants to make us a people who in the midst of the hardest things can strengthen ourselves in the Lord and face anything that comes against us. The key is living from the inside out and not from the outside in. This is how Thomas Kelly puts it. A practicing Christian must above all, listen, this is profound. A practicing Christian must above all be one who practices the perpetual return of the soul 
to the inner sanctuary, who brings the world into its light, rejudges it, and then who brings the light into the world with all its turmoil and its fitfulness and recreates it. What a vision. Do you know what our world is aching for? People operating from a different spirit, people with a different vision, people with a different power stepping into the chaos of our world and offering humanity a different future. New York Magazine this past week had a cover, and here's the cover of the magazine. It says, the city had two choices this past week, dread and anxiety. I took it upon myself to update the cover. Next slide, and here's what I just want to say to you. Listen, dear New York, dear New York, your options are not dread and anxiety. Your options are hope. Listen, I'm, I'm pleading with you. Take, you, you got to build an inner world. I'm pleading with you. Be deep people in a shallow world. I'm pleading with you. Don't know everything about culture and nothing about God. Get into the secret place and and do an experiment on knowing God. I've said this so many times. If you're bored with your faith, I promise you, so is God. God's looking at your faith and He's like, if you want to do a verse, that's fine. I mean, I, I, I love the verse. But I got more for you. And if you want two minutes of answered prayer, I got you, I got you. But why not come out into the depths when you've been in the shallow end of the pool for so long? I have so much more for you. What this generation is actually waiting for is people who have an inner life that when they're tapped, what comes out is kingdom power because they're full with all the fullness of God. Next slide. Between stimulus and response is your greatest opportunity. Here's what the world says. You try and use your own resources to build your life. And we're watching sinkhole syndrome happen around us. But I've got good news for you tonight, folks. You've got power. Next slide. You've got power within you. You've got love within you. You've got stability within you. You've got a kingdom imagination within you. I am very optimistic for your future. So I want us to close tonight by just uh, moving into a time of response. And I just want to ask you this question. How's your soul? How's your inner world compared to your outer world? Does anyone here need fresh power? Some of you are just like, dude, the weight of my life is about to collapse me. and I just need the power that Paul talked about for these Ephesians to be here in New York tonight for me. I've seen God do this for so many people's life. They felt like they couldn't carry the weight and God will come in with His love and power and fill them and they bear up under what they thought would collapse them. Maybe you're here tonight and you still have that inner voice of accusation. And you just can't believe that all that God wants from you is to be present with you. He wants fellowship with you. And so maybe tonight you just need the loudest voice in your heart to be the voice of Jesus, canceling out your past, your guilt, your family of origin, the stuff you've done. Maybe you feel a little shaky, like stuff's wild, you're in between things, or you're uncertain about things, you don't know what's coming next, and you just need fresh rootedness and fresh groundedness. Jesus would love to give you that tonight. Then maybe you need a new imagination. Do not let what has happened to you in your past rob you of the future that God has for you. Look at Mary Magdalene. This is a woman that had seven demons in her. And Jesus cast the demons out of her. And she becomes like one of the best disciples and is the first person to see the witness, to witness the resurrection. And she becomes the preacher to the apostles. So Liz, I just want to say, it doesn't matter what you've been through. God can give you a new imagination of who you can be. And He can make your most painful thing your most potent thing. He can take the thing you're most ashamed of and it can become the most powerful thing you share with others. You need a new imagination. So can we just bow our hearts and invite the Holy Spirit to come and take what I have said and make it real in our midst? And perhaps tonight, if you need any of these things, you need fresh power, fresh love, you feel shaky, you need a new imagine, imagination, you just be willing to just put your hands out in front of you and just, just ask the God we've been reading about to come and fill your life 
right now where you are. I just say to him, Lord, fill me. I want the power from this passage to be in my heart. I want to know that love which is unknowable, Lord. Get it from my head to the deepest part of my being. I want to build a secret world of love with Christ. Maybe you feel like you shake it. Recently, your relationship's broken up, or you're in between jobs, or you've got a big change coming. Just say, Lord, stabilize me. I want to be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. Maybe you need God just to open the horizon of possibility for your life. You think your best days are behind you, that the most important and true thing about you is your sin. And you need God to show you the most important thing about you is your future and who I've made you to be in my kingdom, in your imagination. So, Father, I just want to pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would unleash this power that we've read about tonight, Lord God. Father, I pray you would open a portal from heaven to open this room and that we would experience like what we've read about in the book of Acts. Lord, I pray power would fill these people. Lord, I pray you would fill them with an inner life where they are so caught up in love, so aware of what you've given them. You'd strengthen their capacity to carry your glory. Lord, I pray deeper roots into the soil of your love, a stronger foundation on the work of Jesus. Lord, a new imagination of why you've placed him at this strategic moment of history where almost anything is possible. And Father, I just pray that from this room, through this city, would be inner worlds that transform the outer world of New York. Lord, I pray that you would banish anxiety, depression, fear, insecurity, a sense of being overwhelmed, unwanted and insignificant with a spirit of love, power, a sound mind, a spirit of adoption, power of the resurrection and hope for the days ahead. So Holy Spirit, we are your people. You are the Father's gift and we open our hearts to receive from you now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Folks, why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to move into a time of response right now. I want to invite our prayer team to come forward. Uh, if you need prayer for anything at all tonight, maybe something sort of struck your heart from this sermon. Maybe you sense God drawing you deeper or you just need somebody to pray over you for something that's happening in your life. We're going to close with some worship here. And during the worship, if you want prayer for anything at all, why don't you come forward? And we'd love to be able to pray for you.